time it's about to start now. yeah so the recording is begin now i welcome all present here in the virtual platform of the international discourse on domestic violence and immigration policy for asian indian marriage migrants in the us we all know going to us is kind of a dream come true so this particular session is very very important for all of us not for only those who are looking forward to join usa to go with uh, usa for study and various work, uh, purposes but being the faculty members being the research scholars we can guide our students we can guide our mates if they are planning if they are looking forward to go to us for education for a, any other purpose what kind of things they should have in their mind what kind of implications this is going to bring for them in their life whether personal as well as professional life however today we are specifically focusing on domestic violence and immigration policy and uh, i just hope this session is going to be very very useful for all of us however before proceeding with the session officially formally i would like to invite Dr. Bindu Dogra from Department of Sociology to introduce the college to the audience. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Vinakshi. So, first of all, good evening to all. And my name is Dr. Bindu Dogra from Department of Sociology. Am I audible to all of you? First of all, I just want to confirm. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma yes, ma okay. Okay. Thank you, dear students. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. So again, I extend a uh, good evening to all, and uh, I'm again extending a warm welcome to the August gathering at the virtual portals of Mehrchand Mahajan DAV College for Women, Chandigarh. And I would like to extend a special welcome to our eminent resource person, Dr. Sonia Kapoor, uh, Associate Professor, International Studies, North California. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's my privilege and pleasure to introduce you all to our college. So Mehrchand Mahajan DAV College is a premier institution of higher education for women in this region. This college is a living tribute to the memory of noted legal luminary and educationist Justice Mehrchand Mahajan, former Chief Justice of India. The college functions under the aegis of DAV College Managing Committee, which is successfully running more than 1,000 educational institutions under the able guidance of our worthy president, Dr. Poonam Suriji, Padmashri Awardee. Since its inception in 1968, the college has completed its 55 glorious years decorated with meritorious achievements in every field of learning. No wonder every year our girls create history in the arena of academics and cultural activities for the world to emulate. Along with academic excellence, our sportswomen have bagged Women's Sports Journal Efficiency Shield for a record 39 times and made their mark at both national and international arenas. The college has been ranked among the top institutions of the country by the national dailies and popular magazines such as India Today, The Week, The Tribune. The college has the distinction of being the cleanest college in the residential category in the Swachhata ranking of MHRD Government of India. Uh, Government of India. It was re-accredited with an A grade by the NAC and awarded and awarded uh, A grade by NAC and awarded third rank in the India in the best citizen-led initiative by Ministry of Housing and uh, Urban Affairs in the prestigious Swach Sarvekshan 2019. Our institution has been accorded star status by the Department of Biotechnology, Ministry of Science and Technology. Ministry of Skill Development and Entrepreneurship, Government of India has selected our college as a training center for the Pradhan Mantri Kaushal Vikas, Vikas Yojana. Our college has been nominated as a recognized vocational education Nay Talim Experimental Learning Action Plan Institution by Mahatma Gandhi National Council for Rural Development. We are identified as mentor institution by NAC to formally induct non-accredited colleges in this region. The college is the only institution recognized by Ministry of Food Processing Industries, Government of India, for providing training in bakery. The Institutional Innovation Council of our college was awarded with four stars by Ministry of Education. We also have received certificate of appreciation from Ministry of Education for conducting largest plantation drive in Chandigarh, along with award for the best herbal garden 
and Best Eco Club by the Department of Environment, Chandigarh Administration. The Red Ribbon Club of the college was awarded Best Club by the National AIDS Control Organization for doing a commendable job in spreading awareness regarding HIV AIDS in this region. For comprehensive empowerment of our students, we collaborate with Chandigarh Police to provide self-defense training to our, institute, to our students, along with research initiatives in the area of cyber crimes. Recently, our 90 students completed six months internship under Cyber Swatch Mission to initiate awareness regarding cyber harassment in the region. As an institution, we will continue with this quest for excellence with commitment and perfection. Dear participants, as an institution, we are devoted to the task of nurturing our students in an environment that offers uh, them the space to explore their inner potential in harmony with the contemporary world. Keeping this vision in mind, we have organized this session on domestic violence and immigration for uh, domestic violence uh, for immigrants of Indian marriages policy of United States. Now, uh, before starting the session, I invite Ms. Chavi Lutra, uh, our student to formally introduce our eminent speaker to all of you. Over to Ms. Chavi. Yes, dear Chavi, are you there? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. It gives me immense pleasure and, and a sense of pride to introduce our guest speaker of the day, Dr. Sonia Kapoor. Dr. Sonia is an academician who needs no introduction as the volume of her work speaks for itself. Dr. Kapoor has done PhD in public policy from University of Arkansas. Prior to this, she did PhD in sociology from Jawaharlal Nehru University. Post her graduation in sociology honors, she did MA and MPhil in sociology from JNU. Dr. Kapoor is currently working as an associate professor for international studies program at University of North Carolina. Prior to this, she worked as an instructor in the Department of Political Science at University of Arkansas. She worked on public policy program at the University of Arkansas as, as a graduate assistant. While she was in India, she worked as program manager at Plan India. Prior to this, she also worked as a lecturer at Janki Devi Mahavidyalaya, University of Delhi. She has also worked as a consultant for Save the Children organization. She worked as gender training manager at Center for Social Research. This rich experience started off in the year 2000 when she was a lecturer at Sri Venkateshwar College, University of Delhi. Along with such a rich experience, Dr. Kapoor has been serving as a member of various boards. To name a few, at present, she is a member of Board of Editors, Journal of Poverty and Public Policy at Ville Online Library. She is also a member board of editors, Journal of Soci Sociological Inquiry with Macrothing Institute. She is also a member of board of editors, Journal of Studies in Social Science with Index Press. As part of the university service, she is also serving as a member of Academic Appeals Board member of the advisory committee on minor in human rights studies and member faculty senate university of north carolina she has also served as a member institutional review board diversity intensive committee faculty grievance committee and study abroad committee among the published refer journal articles Dr. Kapoor has written challenges and approaches to teaching about other cultures. She is the co-writer in global citizenship through COIL PBL model, holiday brides and policy concerns, images of battered Asian Indian marriage migrants and so on. Dr. Kapoor has co-edited a book, 
Society and Social Justice, Nexus and Review. She has also been instrumental in published review, re, book reviews, among which Women in the Middle East and North Africa, Changing Continuity, Women in and Out of Paid Work, Changes Across Generations in Italy and Britain are just a few. As befitting such vast knowledge and experience, Dr. Kapoor has been awarded the Block Grant Award for Development Studies Collaboration and Advancement. Public Policy Distinguished Dissertation Award, Summer Research Award for Middle East and Islamic Studies. We are honored to have you here with us today, ma'am. And now I would like to invite you to come and share some nuggets of your knowledge from an unparalleled and distinguished experience. I request all the participants to join me and extend a very warm welcome to Dr. Sonia Kapoor. Welcome, ma'am. Thank you, Chavi, for uh, this warm welcome. And thank you, Dr. Dogra and Minakshi and uh, um, Bhavna you know, yeah. Bhavna yeah. Manan here. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, for before, Sonia, sorry to interrupt. Before we start, uh, I would like to request all the participants here to kindly turn on their camera so that we can see their beautiful faces there. Yes, I'm beginning to see a lot of faces. Thank you for being here this evening. <laughs> yeah, we are all looking forward to, especially the students are quite excited and the whole department is here. We can see Gurjeet ma'am, Ketki ma'am, Raman ma'am, all they are here, so I'm clicking some pictures. Shavi, you also be there, na? Please click few pictures. I'm also clicking few. Smile, please. However, we are going to talk domestic violence, but still we can smile. Thank you so much. Shavi, can you take some few more pictures? No, I will. I was trying to increase the layout. However, it's not coming like that. I can't see all the participants. Kindly click few pictures. Alan sir, you are still looking darker. Can you just brighten your picture so that we can see you? So good evening, sir. Also joined us. It's very good to see you in online, sir. Okay, thank you so much. Over to Sonia. We are looking forward to the wonderful session. Thank you. Thank you. And actually, can you uh, play the presentation? Yeah I, can, yeah, I can share your PPT. All right, thank you. All and right, I so. Notice, uh, sorry, Pallavi from our department is also there. Sorry, I didn't notice. And I'm going to share my screen now. And you just tell me whether you can see it or not. Right. And yes, we can. So thank you so much, Minakshi, for uh, sharing that. Uh, good evening to all of you in India, um, where I am uh, right now. It is a beautiful good morning. Uh, it is 746 here in the morning. And uh, and uh, I am here in the state of North Carolina. And if you see here on the map, I've like put a little red red thing that you see. That's where I am in the city of Asheville. Um, and Asheville, uh, what we would call in India, is like a hill station. We don't use that term here in the United States. But in India, if you know, we were to say, uh, you know, like Shimla, Masuri, uh, this is a hill station here in, uh, in the, of the United States. It's, it's a region which has lots of mountains, beautiful scenery, natural beauty. So uh, if you ever get a chance to be here, I invite you to visit Asheville. A lot of people love the area, and uh, so do I. Um, Today, I'm going to be talking about sharing about a very, very important uh, social problem, which is that of domestic violence, uh, particularly with reference to the Asian Indians uh, who are in the United States. Um, 
But before I do that, let me give you some numbers to really put that into context as to what, what is this population that we are looking at. Um, so there are about 2.7 million Indian immigrants in the United States, and they account for about 6% of the US foreign bond population. Uh, how does this relate to you? It actually is very, very closely related to the state of Punjab because do you know that you know the, who were the first Indian immigrants to come to the US? Does anybody know that? <laughs> they were the Punjabis. So the first people to come to uh, the United States from India, the first ethnic group uh, around 1903 to 1908 uh, were you know, a group of Punjabi people, uh, because as we know, Punjabis are very enterprising people, very, uh, you know, people with initiative, and I'm a Punjabi myself, so I'm proud of, of being a Punjabi. Um, so from 1903 to 1908, they moved to Canada, about 6,000, uh, you know, Punjabis first moved there, and then about 3,000 of them crossed over into the United States and settled here. They basically moved and and were in the area of California, which, which is uh, opposite of where I am. You see I'm on the east, almost on the east coast here. And then uh, on the other side, on the uh, extreme other side, the west coast of United States is where California is. And that's where they settled. Um, but, you know, initial years when they were there, um, they settled into agri as agricultural laborers, as railroad my, uh, people who were into railroad construction. And these were the times when they couldn't bring in um, their families, their wives, children, because of very restrictive immigration policies of the United States. And so uh, they ended up marrying a lot of Mexican women Right. And into we have a lot of immigrants from Mexico coming into the United States, because as you see at the bottom of the map here, um, there is Mexico is, is, is a country just bordering the United States. So a lot of Mexican women, they ended up marrying a lot of Mexican women. But by 1965, all of this changed and from a very restrictive immigration policy to more open immigration policy was there, which allowed not manual labor, not people who were into um, you know, agriculture or labor based industries, but more educated professionals started moving into the United States. So we had the highly educated people, engineers, doctors, along with their families who could now enter the United States by 90, after 1965. And uh, as we will see, that had a certain impact on uh, the silence around domestic violence, uh, because this group, because of its education, because of its success, became what is known as a model minority group. And I'll talk about it a little later in the presentation today. But I just wanted to give you a context of, you know, uh, of, of relating it back to uh, Punjab and to give you context of who was coming in in the initial years and what a, from a restrictive immigration policy to a more open immigration policy by the 1960s. So in this talk, I'm going to focus on policy, both at the federal level as well as the state level. And when I say federal level, what we would call in India as the national level, the, the policies that are made at the central level by the government in Delhi, um, uh, you know, the national government in Delhi. Uh, and uh, then obviously talk about the state level policy. And these are the two areas that I have been working on extensively that I have been studying. Um, Minakshi, if you would move the next slide, please. So um, this is an important social and policy problem, um, given uh, the cultural context uh, and the policy related aspects of the issue. Now, when we talk about domestic violence, because of the numbers, it's, it's a big problem. Every year in the United States, 1.3 million women are assaulted by an intimate partner. And this is irrespective of the cultural background, irrespective of 
um, the nationality, et cetera, right? So we, we do have a big problem in the United States about that. And one in every four women experiences domestic violence in her lifetime. Now, we, while we don't have the exact figures for immigrant women, because there is a lack of, there's a lot of resistance to sharing that, uh, primarily because it stereotypes people from certain nationalities, but you know, we do have an idea, which is that among immigrant women, domestic, uh, you know, the abuse rates are at about 50%. And if we look at the existing data, existing literature, it's the highest among Mexican women, and then, you know, the Asian women, and uh, largely because of the correlation of patriarchal values with intimate partner violence. Uh, next slide, please. So if we are looking at, so what, what I'm going to be uh, talking about today is to help us create a certain awareness of this problem as it exists for the Asian uh, Indians in the United States, and also open up a dialogue for what could be some of the possible solutions uh, so that you know you could start talking about this within your own social network and as Minakshi when she was introducing she said that this is an important problem people from the United from India want to come to the United States and we know we're talking to a group here which is um, a group of students who are girls and they largely come as dependent migrants to the United States so it's an important area to be aware of so that hopefully you don't uh, you don't face any of this, but you know are 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 aware of it as uh, if and if and when you you come to the United States. So um, what I'm going to highlight, as I said, is federal policies and largely two policies in that respect: the immigration policy broadly, and within with correlated with that, the Violence Against Women Act, which is a policy that was brought in in 1994 by um, now then Senator Biden, um, who is now the President of the United States. And I'm going to also talk about the US state policies, uh, largely covering five key areas, arrest, housing, employment, health insurance, and firearms protection protection, possession. Um, all of these, um, so the first part, the federal policy has been something that I have worked over the years and the state policy is what is currently, is a current piece of my research and is a work in progress. Uh, so for all of these uh, policies, the data, um, you know, has been collected from nonprofit professionals nonprofit organizations that we have plenty of them here, at least 30 to 40 um, nonprofit organizations that work exclusively with um, Asian women and Asian Indian women in particular. Uh, we have organizations that, uh, you know, work with, again, within subsets of these, or these uh, groups of people, for example, Muslim women and so on, and they are scattered around the different states. Um, when we look at, so I'm going to start with, uh, you know, giving you a brief overview of what the federal policy looks like. So we, uh, there are five key areas, policy areas that are important to look at with respect to this issue. The first is that, you know, anytime a person comes to the United States, they, uh, you know, as after marriage, they come as a dependent spouse. And most women come as dependent spouse because we do know that, you know, women um, by, by the nature of the relationship that exists and the arranged marriage concept that, that is there in India, um, most women come as a dependent spouse on their husband. So I have classified, um, if you see this table, uh, and this is the next slide. This is slide number four, um, and actually, um, so if if you see this um, uh, uh, table, the first column um, talks about how this issue is for the spouses of of U.S. citizens and green card holders. And green card holders are people who have a permanent right to be in the United States. They have still not become citizens of United States 
but they have to be a green card holder for five years before they can become a citizen of the United States. So most people who come to work here, uh, you know, remain on work visa for a long period of time, and then they move on to becoming a green card holder. They become a green card holder for five years, and then they can become a U.S. citizen. So there are certain rules that are applicable to them, which you would see in column one here. Column two is about spouses of H-1 and F-1 visa holders, which are primarily categories of people who come to the United States as workers um, uh, and uh, as students. So H-1 stands for workers uh, and F-1 for the student visa. And then the third column here is the spouses of L-1 and J-1 visa holders, which are exchange, exchange visitors, people who come here uh, as inter-employed transferees and so on. Now, when you marry a, uh, so, so for each of these, it's when you marry a citizen or a green card holder, what is the conditions when you marry a spouse, uh, when you marry an H1 holder or an F1 visa holder, what happens? And then the third category of when you marry an L1 and J1, what are the restrictions? So um, in all these three cases, um, you're coming as a dependent on your spouse, and that by itself, you know, leads to a situation where it's problematic for a lot of women because the moment you're dependent on your spouse, you are uh, vulnerable to abuse. Now. When the abuse takes place, what's interesting to note here is that if you're a spouse of a US citizen or a green card holder, you can file independently under VAWA, V-A-W-A, -A, as you see in column one, which means that you don't need to prove anything. You just write an application. Uh, you, you know, make a case. You say why, you know, what happened during your marriage and why it is abusive and therefore since it's abusive now, you need a right to independent visa status to continue to live in the United States, which is not the case for the other two columns. As you see, they require a U visa. Now, if so, that means if you're married to somebody who is on H1 or F1 visa or L1 or J1, you and you're abused, you you have to you you have to file for U visa. Now, U visa has special special restrictions. Um, U visa in, is problematic because you need to have a certificate of cooperation from law enforcement agencies. That means that the police has to certify that you have been abused and you have to um, cooperate with the police um, and you have to have a record before you apply for a U visa. Now, we also know as I said before, you know, because this group is a highly successful group, the Indian group, they're professionals, they're educated people, they are seen as a model minority group. So they're seen as somebody whose family values allows for success in the United States. So uh, there's a lot of uh, attempt to maintain the stereotype by the community themselves. We also know domestic violence um, is something that people fear, they shame, they don't want to talk about it, women don't want to say anything about it, and so cooperating or even going to the police uh, to get a certificate of cooperation is problematic for Asian Indian women. Um, what happens in India? You know, in India, when we go to the police to resolve many of our family matters, uh, we are often told that this is a family matter. You can resolve it on your own. And that's the cultural idea that a lot of women, when they immigrate to the United States, bring with them. They think that's what's, you know, it's a family matter. There has to be silence around this issue. And, uh, and then, again, you know, uh, we often keep quiet. We often keep silent um, until the until it about abuse until it's reached a point where you know we say after many attempts of reconciliation of you know trying to um, uh, bear it and uh, and be okay with it then finally you know there is a point where we say okay no and most times by the time the woman reaches the police and law enforcement agencies 
this there may not actually be physical evidence of you know being battered or of, of being uh, abused etc and so it's very difficult uh, because of these factors to make a case but without a police certification she doesn't get the independent right to live in the united states she doesn't get a u visa um again u visa takes a lot of time so it takes one to three years even to process it there's only one agency in the united states that does that um, so, uh, you know, it takes a whole lot of time. Um, work authorization is, you know, again, problematic for a lot of women um, when they come as dependent spouses because uh, not so much for the spouses of U.S. citizens and green card holders. It takes about three to four months before they can get a, um, a, a right to work in the United States. But for the other two categories, uh, it it is problematic now in the last few years and it depends on the administration and when i say administration it depends on who which uh who is the president and which party you know is in power in the united states so under obama administration they allowed for the first time uh after many many years they allowed that uh the wife immediately could have a right to work but when they say immediately the processing by itself takes you know months and years uh, for them to get the right to, to work uh, and then when trump came into power uh, that right was taken away because it was an executive order it was not really a, a law and so he rescinded that Thing and did not allow the spouses to have the right to work immediately. And then again, with Biden coming into power, um, you know, that has been brought back. But it continues to be problematic because it still takes a whole lot of time uh, to process that. Uh, the third important thing is that, you know, immediately uh, when, you know, abuse is happening um, and in, in some of these cases, a lot of uh, the women also come as fiancés to the United States. They may not have gotten married in India. They may have come as fiancés. They may have had a religious marriage in India. There have been a lot of cases where people get religiously married. They may not have any authentic paperwork to prove. And um, there, there, there were a few cases during my research that I was uh, told about where uh, the, the husband went back to the court and said, I was never even married to this person. And so the woman had and you know had to show a lot of pictures of their wedding, but uh, you know they don't know what an Indian wedding looks like. So uh, the husband tried to prove in the court that this was just an engagement ceremony. These pictures are from an engagement. They're not from uh, a wedding. And so even before she could file for her independent status, she had to first prove that she is, she was married to him and this was a good faith marriage. It was not done to get any visa. It was not done for money. It was not done for other purposes before she could be given her independent right to live in the United States. Again, uh, the next important thing is the access to benefits. We have food stamps here, which means, you know, money for food, um, money for housing, that many of these women are eligible because of the Violence Against Women Act, but because they are on an immigrant, they do not have their own status, uh, immigrant status, they cannot get it. Um, and um, for the spouses of US citizens and green card holders, it's available, but for spouses of H1 and F1 it, and L1 and J1, it varies by from state to state. And um, especially if they become illegal, uh, their husband has taken away the dependent spouse visa from them, then you know they're essentially illegal till they are waiting for adjudication on their U visa. And during that time, many of them don't even have a driver's license, have no right to work. They have to continue waiting. 
And the last issue is that of child custody. And that's again problematic because if the children are born in the United States, they are citizens of United States. Now, if the mother doesn't have a right to live in the United States because she doesn't have, a, have an independent immigration status and she decides not to file for a U visa, a, and she decides she just wants to go back to India. She just cannot take the child and go back to India because that often results in a case of child abduction because the child is a U.S. citizen. And so, um, you know, she continues. Many of these women, they continue to stay here. They try to be, be, become students. They join universities so that they may have an F1 visa till, till they can get a U visa. Um, you know, on their own. And uh, there have been cases where, uh, you know, even, uh, you know, the women might have taken the child and uh, have taken the child back. And when after a few years, they tried to re-enter the United States, they were arrested because a case was pending against them from previous time of having taken the child outside the U.S. borders. So quite a problematic issue here at the federal level, um, just because you know, women are here, the dependent spouse, and this dependency has created a lot of problems for them. We'll move on to the next slide. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the state level policies. Uh, and while the federal level policy data that I just shared with you was from four states, which is California, Texas, New York, and New Jersey, for the rest of this presentation, I'm going to also include uh, data from North Carolina. Now, the, the, these are the five states that have the, a very, very significant population of Asian Indians, which is about 50% of the Asian Indian population resides in these uh, five states, with California being the highest, Texas at the next level, uh, New York, New Jersey, and California, uh, and, and uh, North Carolina the, uh, has the lowest amount of uh, Asian Indians. Um, so if you see here, um, <clears throat> I hope you have a rough idea. Uh, California you see in pink on the, le on, on the left side of your screen. Um, you have um, New York, New Jersey on the right at the top. You have North Carolina, I showed you before, I'm, I'm from there, Asheville. And then uh, at the bottom, right in the center, uh, a neon color is Texas. So as you can see, California and Texas are also the, uh, the biggest states uh, here. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, these five key areas, arrest, housing, employment, health insurance, and firearms possession. And I'm going to also share some quotes from the research that I have done. Now, all the states have a mandatory arrest policy. What does that mean? That in, this means that when an abuse takes place and the police comes, um, they have to find who the abuser is and they have to arrest that person. Now, all the states have that policy, which, is, which can be both a support and a hindrance for bringing justice. It is a support because if it is implemented effectively, with very, very sensitized law enforcement agencies, um, then the police officers can determine who the abuser is because they're able to understand how an abuser behaves. They're able to understand cultural aspects of being a victim and an abuser. Uh, and um, But you know this may not be true where they do not have that cultural understanding, where they do not have um, that uh, sensitization. Um, very often, um, you know, when a thorough investigation is not conducted or the nature of the crime is such that the scope of misjudgment is there, there's a wrongful, you know, blaming, wrongful detention of the abuse that ha ab uh, abuse that happens. Um, we move on to the slide number eight. Now here. Here is a quote. Now, how does this play out, right? Uh, here is a quote from North Carolina, one of the respondents that I interviewed. And she talks about how there is, you know, there are language barriers. 
Now, when, a, when an abuse happens and the police officer goes, and we know uh, established literature has established that even though we're talking about, you know, a large population being from, from India being educated and, uh, you know, having literacy skills and all that, we do know from existing literature that still a large majority of these women have language barriers, English language barriers. And so when um, the police officer goes to arrest, she may not be able to explain her case well. Often, uh, we also um, know that the crime could have been committed outside of obviously the officer's presence and now the officer has this authority to sort of determine who's this abuser who's the victim uh, we we do know um, from law enforcement again that even though they may be sensitized many of them are not sensitized enough so when respondents talk to police officers they don't look them in the eye and talk to them Women don't look them in the eye and we know, right? What are we taught in India when we, we're growing up? Don't look up into a man's eyes and talk to him. You know, it's, sign, it's a sign of disrespect, right? And so many of these women don't look into the eyes and talk. And here it is considered like if somebody is not looking into the eyes and talking to you, the police officer is generally trained to think that the person is lying. And these women are not trained to do that. And he assumes that, uh, you know, uh, she is lying and she is actually the abuser. The abuser is, uh, is the actual abuser is also very clever. He, um, you know, doesn't hit at spaces where, you know, the, the, uh, the physical wound is, is visible. He doesn't hit like that. He may abuse in different ways because he's aware of, um, uh, you know, the, the repercussions of that. Um, so it's interesting that behavioral standards of who is a victim might often get determined by the American standards. And um, officer has the right to determine the primary aggressor and determine who the abuser is. But if the officer lacks trainings and skills, and they do, especially in some states, California is more advanced, New York, New Jersey is more advanced, but not so, Texas, not so, North Carolina, not so, because we don't have such a big, uh, you know, population and because of uh, the differences in administration and who is in power in these states. Uh, we So now the question is, in cases where there's no physical abuse, there may be other kinds of control. And we see that from the court here where, you know, the, uh, the testimony uh, exhibits here that the abuser may withhold food, may turn off heating, cooling systems, may, you know, emotionally abuse. There was also a case here where, uh, you know, he would take away the laptop of the person uh, to abuse her. And so uh, she couldn't work. And how do you prove that? How do you prove that law to law enforcement, right? How do you get uh, that certificate for U visa if you really can't prove these kinds of things? Uh, in California, there's also a law called 5150, which is interesting because um, a person might be arrested, you know, if, if there is a danger of physical harm. It says that, you know, 5150 law says, that a person might be uh, arrested if there is a danger that may physical that they may physically harm themselves. We've all seen Bollywood movies, right? We've all seen Bollywood movies, and what is common about Bollywood movies? What does the woman say? Main mar jaungi agar you know main apne aap ko hurt kar lungi main ye kar lungi agar tum mujhe chhodke chale gaye. If you leave me, I'm going to hurt myself. And, uh, you know, she says that when she, when they're in that emotional state of fighting with their spouses, they say that. And the abuser has used that in many cases um, uh, to, to tell that to the police officer. And then the wife has to go through a lot of, you know, um, uh, determination of her mental uh, capacity. And she has to go go through men, uh, tests for psychological sex tests etc to ensure that she is uh, she's fine but and that takes months and that takes a long time to get all of that done so it's it's complicated but there's a cultural background to this there's a bollywood background to this where this is coming from 
Next is uh, slide number 10. We also find that all the five states have policies in place to protect the abused women from eviction, from early termination, uh, lease termination, um, so where they're renting uh, the place, etc. But most of these leases are in the name of the husband because they are the earning member. They are the they are the economically more uh, stable partner. And while while these provisions are helpful that you know they're there that they cannot be evicted early, etc. There are still challenges which are there. Uh, after she, you know, after a, a case of abuse has happened and she has to leave the house, um, securing housing is a big problem. Now, there are transitional homes which are there, shelters, which are what we would call as shelters here, shelters which are there, but they are for um, short term stay only. And um, so the normal shelters are for short term stay. and a lot of NGOs which are working only with Asian Indian women have tried to have long-term shelters for them, but there's a complete shortage of these shelters. Now, in many cases, when the women has to stay in these, you know, mainstream shelters, they don't feel comfortable. There are dietary, you know, restrictions. There's a whole lot of cultural difference in these shelters. And, um, you know, they might, they, 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 there is inconsistency uh, in in how they perceive life versus how the mainstream women perceive life and therefore it makes it very very challenging for these women to stay in those shelters so they try to go to the shelters of the uh, which are run by the asian indian uh, community non-profit sector professionals but again you know there's a big shortage of that uh, so um, you know, that can, and then, you know, they cannot themselves, especially if they're not working, if they, if they lack an independent status, if they do not have uh, employment, they do not have the financial resources to, um, to find housing otherwise. Now, uh, according to uh, the National Network to End Domestic Violence, between 22 to 57 percent of women and children are homeless due to domestic violence. And as I said before, you know, husband is the one who has the lease in their name. And uh, for, for, you know, many of these clients, uh, once they leave home, they're also supposed to say stay 30 minutes away from where their perpetrator lives because of the danger that the perpetrator might come back to attack them. And now 30 minutes away means quite a distance. So it's a disruption of their lives. It's uprooting them from everything as you can see in this quote here in orange uh, so that and and then again some of them don't even have a driver's license to you know move back and forth so it's it's a complete mess for them and these clients are struggling to make ends meet and um, many times if they don't get the housing benefits housing grants right in the beginning they are never eligible to get them, especially uh, this is what came out in the research from Texas, that if you don't get it in the first place, you're not even eligible for many of these housing grants. And in any case, many of these women are not eligible because they're sort of illegal uh, immigrants anyways. Uh, what we see with regard to employment, that many of the states have policies that protect a woman's employment. Um, in case she becomes a victim of domestic violence, there are some civil legal remedies in place for women who are working who are already employed. And uh, these policies range from guaranteed leave to, due to domestic violence to employers making reasonable concessions, accommodations for victims of violence, um, and also you know, obtaining protection orders to ensure a safe working environment for employees. But there's a lack of consistency across the board. And I'm talking about slide number 12 here. Um, we do see in New York and California, there are very good policies in place. Again, not so in Texas does not have that. Uh, okay, can you they, confirm this is the slide you are looking for? No, I'm not, um, I can't see the number actually. Okay, let me know. Uh, you just have to move forward, please. Next, next, next. 
next <laughs> okay this is okay. yeah yeah thank you okay all right so um new york and california have some good policies in place but texas does not and it is again time consuming to even go through this whole process. So for example, you know, even, even when women have these benefits, they, um, and, you know, in the recent years, there has been because of the Me Too movement and other things, the employers are becoming more aware of this, but um, often as, as it came out in the interviews, survivors just want to move on to the next thing. They're like, I don't even want to fight this. Uh, anymore because I'm already fighting on so many other fronts that, you know, I'll just let this be and just move on with my life. Is I don't want to be fighting a personal, you know, a, 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 a battle with my spouse and then battle with my employer here. So let's just move on. So, but, you know, uh, these benefits, the employment-based benefits, they, they are becoming more aware of it, but still need to be in place. Uh, to really for for the for the benefit of these women. Again, uh, reporting. Uh, you know, if we look at health insurance and benefits, reporting by uh, healthcare providers of any suspicious injury and healthcare providers, the doctors, right? When these women go to doctors, reporting by healthcare providers of any suspicious injury is mandatory. So they have to report it, but only if the person has suffered physical injury or is in danger of the same. Um, you know, there is a law, law which is health insurance portability and accountability uh, law. And, uh, you know, specific states have their own laws, like Texas has the Medical Records Act, etc. So at the state level, you know, that is there to protect the personal health information. And there's confidentiality, right? So that's great. That's great to have. But... It also means that this is not for everyone as um, abused women fear that information might reach the community. And as we said, you know, they want to maintain this image still, silence around this issue. Uh, and so that has repercussions. Um, the What's again interesting is that in some states, um, women have their independent health insurance. In most states, because you know it's the husband who's working, you get insurance through the employer here. So the husband gets insurance and then he also buys insurance through his employer for his spouse and his children. And once he takes away the, uh, you know, that right uh, is taken away, then the woman is left with no insurance. Now, in some states like New York, that provides free, free health insurance to these women. But there's still, um, you know, and again, in North Carolina, you know, if you are on a group insurance, that's fine if you're a victim of domestic violence, but not if you're on an individual insurance. Uh, so there are no protections for that. So she immediately loses her right to insurance. She also... Um, you know, cannot report back to the her her domestic uh, her domestic violence case is reported only if she has physical injury. But you know what happens if she just comes and tells the doctor she's going through uh, a, a domestic violence case, but she may not have any physical injuries. In that case, it is not mandatory on the doctor to inform the agencies, and um, so. Probably that needs to change at some point, but that also makes her extremely vulnerable in her community. Uh, and in some of these cases, a lot of women, you know, may may not have left their partner. They may not may they may still be trying to work out things. And so, if they come and report any of these things, they fear, you know, their partner might retaliate or um, might uh, you know harm them in more ways. So um, we do have, again, like uh, from uh, Calif in California, there's health care for all the children, which is available, regardless of immigration status. But, you know, we also have a policy here in the United States, which is the Medicaid policy. And, um, you know, in some cases, uh, if a person is disabled, there are certain kinds of provisions which are not covered in those policies. And so if somebody has regular illness, they are covered, but if they have you know, extreme levels of illness, which is not covered by, covered by that policy, 
you know, um, they, they, some of those disabilities are, they have to pay then extra insurance money to get those, uh, get treatment for that. Um, and I kind of already explained, uh, you know, the group health insurance um, thing, which is, you know, if they ha are on a group health insurance, then, you know, in some of the states like North Carolina, they can, they are eligible for um, domestic violence related um, issues that come up and medical needs that come up, but not in uh, all the states and not when they, they have individual insurance. Um, the again the you know um, for any of these benefits right uh, you have to apply to an agency and uh, if someone um, goes to the agency doesn't have a traditional uh, you know case of being a tradition doesn't fit into the traditional definition of domestic violence doesn't have a police report doesn't have a restraining order um, then something of that nature then you know many of these women uh, which, which they opt out of they're not going to the police they're not trying to get a restraining order a restraining order is an order that you can get from the courts to say that this person who's harming me needs to stay away from me cannot come in a certain physical proximity that's a restraining order and if they don't have any of those things then there's no tangible proof that they can give to the caseworker to make a case for them, to give them the benefits, uh, provide them the benefits of housing or, you know, insurance or money or food stamps, or et cetera, et cetera, that they may be, that they may be eligible for. Um, Minakshi can, I, I'm not sure, let me just check the slides. So can you move forward, please? Um, yeah, thanks. Okay, so we, the, the last issue here is of the firearms possession and um, gun control is a highly, highly controversial issue in the United States and is also significant in the context of domestic violence. Um, what does it mean? Like here people have a right, it, it's okay to have, have guns and to keep them. Um, we also know that um, according to the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence, um, most intimate partner hom homicides are committed with a firearm. And uh, it's estimated that chances of domestic violence situation increase by about 500% if a gun is present. What is also interesting is that the use of a weapon in domestic violence situations involving the population of our study is minimal. So a lot of the Asian Indian community doesn't use um, guns that much, but it's still an issue. Uh, it is highly controversial here. And um, for example, you know, uh, there have been cases which were reported, which comes out as, as you can see in this quote, where um, the, the, uh, the person feared that, uh, you know, her husband has an, has a weapon and at the federal level, uh, there is a policy which says that, you know, if, if, if uh, in, in this case, as, as it was uh, referred back, that we went to the court with a client once and she was worried that her husband had one or two guns and she had put in her application, I would like him to be prohibited from owning these weapons. So the judge was not able to enter that into the order in North Carolina, even though there is a federal law which is there, uh, but at, at the state level, the law is not there. So there is a gap also in, in some of the states because our law enforcement agencies, they do not even have the money or the space to be able to search the homes, take possessions of these firearms, keep them in their stations themselves. So in this case, you know, it is a sort of a trust where the, where the a trust process of the judge who's saying, if you need to remove firearms, then, you know, you believe that they actually did that. And um, in, in this case, as, as I said, you know, they had clients who said that I've removed them, but, you know, they will keep it in the house and they'll still give it to a friend to keep and so on. So it's quite dangerous in that sense, but is not such a big issue for our community. But still, there are some kind of um, uh, evidence and instances where the, this has, you know, created problems. So 
Just briefly, uh, you know, uh, these are some of the issues that the Asian Indian community is facing. And what does that mean in terms of, you know, what needs to be done? So while advances have been made, as we can see, U visa is, is very good uh, move. It is a great provision to have. Yes, there are gaps, but it's a great provision to have. Employment benefits are again great provision to have. Um, you know, um, some restrictions on firearms possessions is great. Housing, a lot of work has been done. So a lot of advances have been made, but a lot still needs to be accomplished. Um, as the building blocks of adjudication, they vary across different states and localities. And how do we bring it and make it more consistent across laws and policies? That has to be there so that, you know, the negative effects, uh, the, 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 so that the positive effects of some policies are not affected by what's negative in others. So how do we make these laws more consistent um, is, is something that, that requires um, more initiative. Um, there's a gap between policy and implementation that again needs to be bridged. Um, there has to be greater advocacy uh, to bridge these gaps with law enforcement, with caseworkers, greater sensitization, cultural sensitization that needs to happen. Um, and, you know, of course, there has to also be more research uh, about how these policies may be better handled and addressed to make life simpler easier for these abused women rather than you know more complicated and challenging so while we do see a lot of advances we also see uh, gaps still existing because it's related to uh, you know a lot of a lot of them are related to the cultural context and um, the gap between uh, policy making and its implementation so with that, I am going to stop here, but I'm happy to take any questions. Um, uh, and I hope, uh, you know, that it sort of made sense. <laughs> it was actually a wonderful presentation. And even we couldn't realize that it has been uh fifth, last 50 minutes you were talking about the rules and regulations however listening to the rules and regulation i find sometimes very monotonous but listening to you actually you were pinpointing everything in a very simple and easy uh, manner so i uh, need to ask my students or any other participants if they have any question because i have one question to ask but before uh, i am going to ask okay bindu ma'am wants to ask something yes ma'am Please unmute yourself. Yes. Uh, am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay. First of all, I just want to congratulate you for such a wonderful presentation on this topic. And, uh, you know, you have revealed many aspects of uh, this issue to us in a very, very simple way. So there is just one curiosity which I want to, you know, in the form of question, I want to ask you. And uh, I know that the patriarchal setup and the cultural notions which the women they carry over there, they are creating a lot of hindrance in availing the you know uh, basic support system which is available. And there are various uh, policy gaps also there. Uh, I just want to know that uh, what sort of role Indian embassy is playing over there? Because I personally feel that in most of the cases when there is uh, any such issue, so they approach Indian embassy. So do they have any system to support and to provide any sort of help or guidance to such women to resolve the issues? Yes, they actually do even have flyers and pamphlets, uh, you know, of what are some of the things that Indian women, when they're getting married, need to be careful about what kind of resources are there so they do have a lot of tie-ups with the nonprofit organizations that help so if if women do approach them they give them the contacts of these nonprofit organizations uh, they they also uh, you know when they uh, uh, I've been told that, you know, the, the flyers are available when women, um, you know, apply for uh, a dependent spouse visa. They are given these so that, you know, they, they are made aware of and it has a checklist of things that women need to be careful about and think about as they uh, decide to immigrate to the United States as a dependent spouse. So even before they actually enter, they're given this checklist so that they but, you know, it all depends. It again depends how how 
seriously the woman is reading it and thinking about it because when you first get married right you think it's all going to be nice and you probably just throw the pamphlet away right? yeah, very much so, um, yeah so uh, but the indian embassy is playing a key role and they do put people into contact with uh, non profit organizations who work very consistently uh, in coordination with the with the embassies but again you know all the, the embassies are not in all the states mm. so uh, you know they're only in certain um, bigger uh, areas so two or three different states <laughs> Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, just one more thing that, uh, you know, we are mostly talking about women as victims. So have you ever come across a case where the males are also, you know, victim of domestic violence? Because nowadays in India, we are, uh, you know, coming, such cases are coming up where even males are, uh, you know, victim of domestic violence. And uh, sometimes even the ladies are using, misusing the laws which are there for mm -hmm. protecting them in case of domestic violence. So have you ever come across such kind of thing over there? I have personally not come across, but I, from from what I know, yes, you know there there are cases, and uh, you know uh, men are being uh, har harassed as well. They are being abused as well, and this is you know going to be more and more. We will begin to see this even more, uh, you know, as we are beginning to already see it. But again, there's a silence, right? Men would be more silent because of their masculinity. Yes. Wouldn't want to come out as openly if women don't want to come out. Men also have a greater, you know, ego and masculine uh, identity attached yeah, with them. Very true. So, um, but it's not like that is not happening. But we still see that as a bigger issue for women because just because of the numbers and the maturity right yes. now. Very true. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a question, uh, Sonia. Like you said, it takes time if you are uh, going as a dependent spouse in US. You, uh, you know, you are going to take time to have the right to work, or you are going to settle there. So, if we are, if someone is planning to get married to a US citizen or maybe a green card holder. So the process of getting all the formalities done, can, can it be started uh, here only before the actual marriage happens so that the formalities can be completed and then the person can eventually move up, move to the US with all the rights to work and all. Is it possible before marriage? It is possible for US citizens and green card holders, but okay. there's a long wait, right? And uh, what what's also interesting is that for, um, you know, you, you can only come here as a spouse of H1 or L1. Uh, you know, in fact, they can come here immediately. If you get married to H1, L1 on those categories, you can come here immediately. For green card and citizens, if you get married, you still have a waiting period. In fact, you know, uh, four years back, it was 10 years of waiting period. So people didn't want to marry a green card holder in India or a citizen. I mean, citizen is still easier, but green card was like, you know, there was a waiting list, waiting time of seven, eight, ten years for them. So people, in fact, you know, when they were trying to find arranged marriage spouses, they were looking at finding H1, H1 uh, workers in the U.S. rather than green card holders, because they said, if you're marrying a green card holder, I'll have to wait alone in India for eight years. And that by itself can be a cause for you know, you staying with your in-laws back in India, you know, it can all, all, all always be a case of more abuse, in fact. And so, um, uh, you know, th those things, and if you marry an H1, unless you decide to also find a job before you come here, and then, you know, decide to, I'm sorry, if you hear some noise, my dog it's here okay, is. Okay. Because so, I know one of, uh, I know one of my friend, her husband is a scientist in the USA, he is working as a scientist, but she couldn't get the visa formalities done. It's past three years now. Now she is planning to move there on student visa. Maybe I'm not, if I'm not wrong, she is planning to pursue studies there. Earlier, she was not ready to uh, study there. She was uh, looking forward to work there, but now she is planning to move on a student visa. Yeah, that's, that's the easiest way for her to then come because of the long waiting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Nimrat has a question. Yes, Nimrat, please unmute yourself and ask. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, hi, Sonia, ma'am. I'm Nimrat. I'm a student from Punjab University. I'm doing my master's in political science. 
I do have one question that uh, you mentioned about a patriarchal society. So when we discuss like uh, patriarchy is in our roots, like it began from Manu and uh, it's still going on. So my question is, why did patriarchy become so oppressive? A society uh, like a today's society, it is so advanced to say, but it is not when it comes to domestic violence and we counter encounter so many cases of domestic violence when it comes to international po- international level or a national level or even a local level right and uh, a counter question to this is that what could be the best solution according to you to beat patriarchal society or the issues which are emerging in patriarchal societies and affecting feminism I mean, we have to work with men as much as we have to work with women. And I think that is the problem that we currently have, that we're working with women. We are talking about their rights. We're making them more educated. But we're doing not as much work with the men. And I think, you know, unless we do the same amount of of work with boys and and men in our society, it's going to be one-sided. It's even going to be more problematic. I think I was just reading an article the other day which kind of talked about the same issue. It was saying we are working with our, you know, we're taking the women to this level where they are becoming, you know, economically independent, they're becoming educationally, you know, very, very successful. But the men have remained here. We have not worked. We've not sensitized them. We're not working in changing their values. Some work is beginning to happen. I think more work needs to happen so that they both begin to move at the same pace and only then something can be done about patriarchy. Otherwise, it's, it'll, it'll be a reverse, you know, and uh, we would not you know, it, it, it would not resolve the situation unless and until we actually work with boys and men to uh, change the values that, you know, we teach them from childhood, we teach them in their youth. Um, and just working working with women is good, but just working with women and girls is, uh, is not going to resolve it either. So. Thank you, ma'am. So any other question? Yes, sure. Uh, good evening, ma'am. Thank you for so much for the session, firstly. Uh, ma'am, my question for you is that, as you mentioned, that the policies at the federal level as well as the state level are quite different regarding every uh, issue relating to violence and other issues as well. So, ma'am, what exactly, like, why is it so that even such issues which are so important to a person's life is uh, is uh, at a very polar like either it is totally agreed upon like you mentioned that president biden had signed the executive order or president obama had signed it but then uh, president trump had reversed it so what can be done to kind of reduce that bipartisanship uh, sorry to remove that polarized ideal and kind of make it a basic right that like every woman has over there I think uh, at a larger level, the recognition that domestic violence is a problem is there, right? But we, uh, you know, we do have this polarization because we have two different political parties in power and immigration is a very, very controversial subject in the United States. Um, We have so many people coming in. It has, you know, um, there are arguments made for economic reasons why we don't want immigrants here uh, you know because they will take away the jobs as recession uh, you know as as the world economy is again getting affected we and you know we have more we will have more and more of these discussions um you know we continue to have i mean of course you know the democrats have a different political orientation to towards immigrants and they're more pro immigrants um, that's why, um, you know, we do see um, policies under Obama administration and Biden administration more in favor of, um, you know, immigrants versus, you know, the Trump administration when it was in power, because we know how the Republicans are against the, the um, you know, the wider immigrant community. And so, uh, you know, those challenges, um, I mean, you know, have to be, have to be, uh, 
um, addressed, but because they have so many implications at various levels, uh, you know, and many of them are economic, many of them are benefits, uh, you know, that immigrants may or may not be able to get. Uh, it is about, you know, larger leadership in the world, um, you know, so a so lot of issues tied with it and unless um, and and even though we agree, I think at a larger level, there's an agreement that women's issues are important. Uh, it's also about redistribution, you know, you know, redistributive policy is the most difficult to make, which is, you know, do you take something from somebody and give it to somebody else? That's a difficult policy to make. India is facing the same example, right? Women's representation bill, uh, quota bill, right? It's it's hanging there for last, what, 20, 30 years? Because what you have to do is take something from the men and give it to the women, the seats in parliament, and, and the men don't want to give it. So uh, it's, it's the politics around, uh, you know, it's the politics of the issue um and uh, that that is problematic i think the i think the best thing we can say here sonia that i am learning i have just learned from your presentation that we need to be informed before taking any decision if we are like it's kind of a dream come true moving abroad for many many of the students females here and they thought they may think that going abroad would be a solution to their problems but they should be informed. If they want to take a decision, they should be informed of all the implications. And that's why we have organized this session and you have beautifully explained everything. Ketki ma'am has a question if you want to answer. Ketki uh, ma'am is from our department only. Yes, Ketki ma'am, please go ahead. Uh, hello, Dr. Sonia. Hello. Uh, really glad to see you, partly because uh, you are from JNU. I myself is also from JNU. Very happy yes. to see you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one issue I wanted to uh, bring into the notice, the definition of domestic violence itself is different in these two cultures. Like uh, Asians, typically Indians are, Indian women especially, are very much tolerant towards violence. Like they do not consider violence unless it is physically done. So emotional, economic, or psychological violence, women hardly consider as, as violence. So that has to be also taken into account. Definition itself is at variance. You are absolutely right. And I think a lot of uh, the women who actually come to these NGOs after you know years of going through that, have have be our first taught you know what is abuse and then they're like i didn't even know that i was going through this i did not even realize this is abuse and a lot of these nonprofit organizations that's the first thing they do with these women when they actually you know uh, meet them and they also have like sessions outside where they you know go to these fairs they set up tables there and when women come you know people are just walking around they tell them you know are you facing these things or you know when you face these things, that's abuse. So you're right, you know, culturally, it's absolutely different. That's, the, again, the reason why many of these women don't go to the police, don't go, uh, don't want to report anything, don't want to talk about it. They just say, you know, ye to, this is a family thing. Ye to hota rehta hai. Ye to mein um, hai, violence hota hai. Is, yeah, violence is quite normalized in, uh, I think, Indian households. Whether it's uh, at any other level, it is quite normal, I guess. We You're are right. actually uh, trained, we are actually socialized to be very humble, to be very polite, to be tolerant actually, to be tolerant. Being a woman, you need to be a tolerant and uh, you should be the first one to take the step to prevent, uh, you know, from your relationship to ruin, you should be the first one to take the lead. That That's our, uh, from our socialization yeah. point of view. Yeah. It's the upbringing there where we are told that a woman has to, you know, chukna, like woman ke le thik hai, right? Juk, juk jao, juk jao, koi baat nahi. You know, ghar chalane ke le, women have to do it. You know, so that's kind of interesting. I just wanted to, you know, Minakshi, when you were talking about, you know, everybody becoming aware and more inform informed about this, I just also wanted to talk about, you know, in Punjab, and this is one of my other works, which is on the holiday brides. 
you know, a lot of Punjab in Punjab villages, many of these men come back during holidays, they get married. And this was, you know, until a few years back, of course, there's greater awareness now um, that, you know, they would leave their spouses back, back in these villages. And therefore, these women got to be termed as holiday brides. So the husbands would come back for holidays, they would marry these women, and then they, they, uh, these women would end up staying with their in-laws, you know, taking, being the caregiver for their in-laws here while the husband would go back. And because they were really not married, you know, uh, officially, like in, in the court or, um, you know, they, these were just like sort of social weddings that were performed, they would go back and marry in their own country. So there have been, I think, lots of thousands of cases of women being left back in the villages and uh, while their husbands have gone back. So they were termed as the holiday brides and that's happened quite near where you are in Punjab itself. So, so they are actually resolving their issue of taking care of their family here in India so that they can live peacefully there. Yeah. Yes. And because the immigration law is so uh, like, you know, before they can take them, they don't send any paperwork back for them. They don't do anything. They just leave them and they abandon them as we would call it. Yeah, we are moving. Forward. And before we close the session. Yeah. Uh, because we have a lot of students uh, today. They are attending this session. What is that one advice that you want to give? I think because he, here we have a lot of girls here, the one advice I would give is be economically independent. Like the moment you are economically dependent, that's the first vulnerability that happens. Secondly, be, be informed, as Minakshi said, you know, uh, when you... Uh, when, when if, if 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 any of these girls decide to marry somebody from the United States, be aware of what rights you would have and you know what steps and which organizations and what network you you need to build your own network many of the women who come here have no network they feel they have no social support and keeping your social support being open to talking to people will only encourage them to uh, get the resources that are required in case something like this happens and to the extent possible you know make your own independent status in a way that you can be you know even if it may take you a few years if you come you know as a dependent spouse that's not bad you know if it's a good relationship you can actually enjoy that but ultimately you know the longer you are economically dependent the more vulnerable you become in many situations so true so, so true Thank you. So that's what I would say. <laughs> so it was a wonderful uh, talking to you. And I would like to hand over the platform to the uh, to Bhavna ma'am for delivering the official vote of thanks. However, we just want to keep on listening to you. It's such a relevant session we attended today, uh, Sonia. We are really, really glad that you have, you know, discussed such a such serious issue in such a simplistic uh, manner. And you have opened us those aspects. Even many of the, I think, students didn't have even think about that. So wonderful. Over to Bhavna, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Minakshi, Dr. Sonia Kapoor, our guest speaker for today, respected Madam Principal, Dr. Nisha Bhargav, dear colleagues and my dear participants. It's an honor to propose a vote of thanks. I, on behalf of Mehachan Mahajan DAV College for Women, express my gratitude to you, ma'am, for gracing today's session. It goes without saying that the first step to overcome relationship abuse is to understand the meaning of domestic abuse. Dr. Sonia has covered all the major provisions like 5150 law, Medicaid, firearms provision regulation and policies for the domestic violence in the US. The various forms of verbal, emotional, economic abuse and incest are issues that are less talked of. More men migrate for work and more women migrate for marriage. This session has been an eye opener for the students. It has certainly made us ponder over things we should be aware of, like health insurance, uh, group health insurance, etc. With these words, I would like to end the session. We are grateful to Madam Principal for always supporting us in organizing such sessions. I want to thank all the faculty members who could join us today for this session. 
Finally, a big thanks to all the wonderful participants. It could not have been possible without your presence. It's time to log out. We will meet again soon with yet another intriguing concept. Till then, take care. Over to you, Manakshi. Thank you so thank much, ma'am. Sonia, thank you. Thank you so much for the wonderful session. I hope all of our students are looking forward to have more interaction with you in future. And yeah, you are coming to India and I'm looking forward to that visit as well. So thank you so much, uh, dear Sonia. And it was actually an informative session. We have just not only, you know, discussed a social problem, but yes, before taking such a big decision in your life, you need to be informed on such a relevant, uh, you know, aspects so that they may take uh, their decision wisely and they lead a happy life. And the takeaway of today's session, girls, economic independence is should be the most important goal of your education. That's what only we can say. So thank you so much from the team of PG Department of Sociology. We thank all the teachers there. Thank you so much, Bhavna, ma'am. Thank you so much, Bindu, ma'am. You are looking yeah, beautiful. Thank you. thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Sonia. And uh, all stop my yeah. And uh, yes, uh, there is feedback form link, which is uh, posted in the chat box. So yeah. these students and participants, please fill it before leaving the session. Minakshi, yeah. kindly stop the recording. Yes, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so thank much. You. Yeah, we are looking forward to, you know, have an offline thank kind you. of session with you. Okay, wonderful. <laughs>